Today I'm very lucky to be interviewing Ellen Sentier, author of Moon Song. Thank you so much for agree agreeing to do this interview. Can you tell our little our listeners a little bit about yourself? Well, hello. It's very good to be doing this interview. I'm British, as you can probably all hear, <laughs> and um, I was born to a family with a long lineage in the British shamanic tradition let's call it that because that's the word that everybody knows mm -hmm. well, is isn't a British one it's the old ways of Britain the old magic ways the old witch ways cunning ways and they've been going on for, for ages in Britain really forever and my family's always done it hmm. so you grew up in a pagan type atmosphere then yes I did but we weren't cut off from um, people who were Christian uh, mm -hmm. or anything else. Um, it was just normal. There were quite a lot of people in the village who followed the old ways. We all actually went along to church as well and looked after the vicar and supported him because <laughs> he was a nice <laughs> bloke. <laughs> well, that's good, though. It's it's kind of like the Pope that we have now in the Catholic Church. I actually mm -hmm. like this one. So. He's much better, isn't he? Yes, yes. Uh, it was like everybody works together. Mm -hmm. uh, this was down in the west country of Devon. Um, the moor is called Dartmoor and Exmoor. Mm -hmm. I was born on Dartmoor and I grew up on the northern moor on Exmoor. So it's quite, it's still quite wild and quite countrified. It's not in the least like being in a city at all. Oh, that must be beautiful then because I love, I love the countryside and stuff. I've always wanted to see England and Ireland and Italy and just you know because they have so much more uh, land than they do building you know what I mean I live in the state uh, so well, yeah don't <laughs> anymore. you're better off than us for that <laughs> but when you get to the wild places it is beautiful it's, mm -hmm. it's really lovely and you just feel such a connection with it you know you're up there on the high points of the moor and you see because we're down on the west west country in the west coast we can actually see when we're on the hills, the fronts coming in across the Atlantic. Oh, wow. Yeah, you actually see this huge cloud mass coming at you and you think, hang on, I better get shelter in half an hour. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> at least you get to see it coming. <laughs> it doesn't take you by surprise. <laughs> and if you've got, if you've got a, you know, if you, you're under some sort of shelter or sat in the car, you can actually watch it all come and it, it's watching weather, it just, so different than just being rained on. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, you feel the, the spirit of the storm and it's really, really beautiful. It's really nice. Wow. Now, you went to Exeter University, correct? I did. Okay. Also down in the West Country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I did, um, well, I was one of the first people to get a degree in what's called modern educational dance, which was developed by a German chap called Rudolf Laban and is used in lots of other places than dance because it actually looks at what you say with your movement and with your shadow movement. Oh, it's almost like the Hawaiian dance, the way they do the, um, the hula <laughs> and stuff like that, similar to well, that? The ideas behind it are, but it's not so structured as that. It's about if I'm moving my right hand, you will watch my left hand to see what my left hand does. Mm -hmm. Because the right hand is the one that my front brain is looking at and thinking about, and the left hand is the one that the subconscious is thinking about. So it's the one that's probably going to tell the reality if I'm trying to sort of spin a line on you. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting. That it's used in, They use it in interviews and places like that as well. But the dance itself is gorgeous because you just, you learn about expressing and you learn so much about your body. And we were asked if we wanted it to be a degree because it didn't start off one mm -hmm. when we went first to college. And it seemed to be the right sort of thing. And now there's a huge school in London which does it, but that's long, long after me. <laughs> <laughs> But that must have been very, very interesting to, to learn how to do. It was lovely. It really was. I was lucky, too, because the other side of it, um, just down the road, is a place called Dartington. And at the time, 
they had um, the Martha Graham School down there, Martha Graham Dance, con Contemporary Dance School down there. And it's only, what, about 20 miles. So we used to go down there and do contemporary dance classes and they would come up to us and do the Laban classes with us. So we, we got to learn an awful lot while we were there for the three years. It was lovely. It sounds like it. Now, mm. you went on to become a transpersonal psychotherapist? Yes. What exactly is a transpersonal psychotherapist? <laughs> <laughs> a weird one. <laughs> Um, it's one of these, I don't know why everybody in these things has to have great long names for everything, but it's <laughs> across and trans is, means across and beyond the personal. So you're not just dealing with the personal self, um, your everyday self, uh, who is Ellen Sancier, for instance, mm -hmm. um, you're dealing with the spirit behind that. Ah, and it's what perhaps the only one, really, the only psych psychology that really goes deeply into that, although Jung does, because, of course, Jung did it himself. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what it's about. It's like, what is behind this without necessarily calling it a religion or anything like that or making it structured, but just saying that, Everything has spirit. Mm -hmm. People have spirit. And there is something more than just the, the flesh and blood and DNA that we run around with in each lifetime. Mm -hmm. So that was quite fascinating for me because I didn't know um, until I met these people that there was a psychology that did this. And, of course, once I found it, it was like, I want to be it. I want it. I want it. I want it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, it's amazing, though, that, that it seems that over in the UK, you guys have way more for learning than we do here in the States. Because I had never heard of that. Ah, well, you might be on the wrong side of the country. That's possible. I'm on the East Coast. There isn't much here. <laughs> I, 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 I live out in the way. sticks of Maine, so we there's don't have lot, much here. There's a lot of trans, the transpersonal um, over the other side of the mountains, over the West Coast. Ah. So see. if you start Googling around you'll probably find, and there's some very good people and teachers and groups and, and things, and there may well be over on the East Coast too, but I know there was a lot of it there. There's a lot of it in Ireland too, if you ever come over. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, see, I'd love to do that. Oh, would I love to do that. Now, you're a writer and a teacher for yes. British Native Shamanism? Yes. Um, I've always wanted to write, but the teaching stuff, I've I got pushed into very much the end of the 1980s. People kept asking me, people kept saying, come on, do this, come on, do that, come on, do the other. And what to call it was very difficult because what we call ourselves are our wenis, mm -hmm. um, which is um, an old British word, a Welsh word. And once you start getting into those, well, you've probably seen them written. I mean, they don't have vowels. Mm-hmm. Um, so you sort of think, um, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and awareness means spirit keeper. And that is really what a shaman is too. And the shaman is the word that is very well known around the world now. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, this is our native tradition, what I've been brought up in, and a lot of friends have as well. I mean, I'm not certainly not the only person. Uh, people get people from all over the country have been brought up in it. And I thought, right, okay, I'll call it that, and then at least people will know roughly what I'm talking about, that I'm not talking about Wicca or Gardnerianism or alchemy or something like that. Yeah. And it gives it, it, gives it a label which people can get a handle on. And, um, but it's, it is the, what has grown up here. It's what my family did, what the villagers did, what goes back probably as long as there have been people in Britain. <laughs> wow. That is amazing, though. Now, for 25 years, you lived in London? I did, yes. I did enjoy it, too. Despite now, I live, you know, I love living in the country, and I was brought up in the country. Mm -hmm. But it, the 25 years were good. Um, I was working for the Ministry of Defence, because I 
had to be in my normal box, as I put it. <laughs> <laughs> I probably should have left earlier, but I didn't. And I was a sort of whiz-bang software person writing mm. personal databases and things for our Ministry of Defence. And that was in London. And it was very good fun. I enjoy London, and there was masses to do, and I was able to continue the dance there. Mm-hmm. There's, there's big dance schools around, and I made friends with someone who did ja- jazz, jazz dance, mm-hmm. and Dr. Raleen Phillips. Who, have you heard of her over there? I have not, but I love jazz, so I'm like, hmm, I should have heard of this name, so now I'm going to have to check her out. <laughs> She is quite famous. She used to run a group called Hot Gossip, mm-hmm. and um, who were very wild and uh, quite gorgeous. And, my, and she also taught. She'd do jazz classes, as I'm sure you have over there. Oh, yes. You, you know, and um, my friend taught for her, and I was the demonstrator. So that my friend could do, you know, we're going to do this, and she'd do the movements, and then music would start, everybody gets going. My friend needs to go around and check everybody's doing it right. Mm -hmm. But everybody else needs somebody to follow. So I was the person they followed. Ah. So you were kind of the assistant. (laughs) I was. Yeah. Well, it meant I got free classes. That was really good. (laughs) You cannot beat that. Now, you're living um, in Weir? Why? I think that's near the river. Why? (laughs) Why? Okay. I won't give it to you in Welsh. (laughs) (laughs) Um, the River Wye, a great long river, from starts up near Snowdon in the West Welsh mountains, and it comes down and it joins the Severn. And I expect mm-hmm. you've heard of the Severn. Yes, that's, I have. Yeah, that's right, the one that goes past Bristol. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of our mother rivers. It's one of the big rivers, you know, that's been around and that have, has masses of stuff, old stuff, old sites old places along it mm-hmm. um, and it's where I live is the border between Wales and England Ah, and it's called the Welsh Marches which is a Norman term because the Normans decided that they didn't want us beastly horrible Britons coming in so they built a load of castles along the border and said keep out oh nice <laughs> yeah, it's a great time you know yeah <laughs> Segregation. You stay over there. <laughs> it's not new. We don't think it's new, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's been going on for a long time in every country. So, yeah. yeah. Hasn't it just? So, I live in this, uh, and the border, of course, has moved, which is quite fun. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, every time, every now and again, the, we Welsh would go and shove that way, and so the English would get back a bit, and then they'd shove the other way, and we'd lose a bit of land. So, I live in this sort of shadowy place mm. that sometimes been England and sometimes been Wales and it's like living yeah it's like living in two lands at once but either way it's got to be a beautiful land <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. it yes. really is um, there's big hills no mountains big hills enormous rivers and then tiny little streams lovely woodland um, lots of wildlife yes yes we have a lot of that around us here at home <laughs> Which is beautiful. See, I love that. I love being out in nature. Uh, I lived on 36 acres of land for a while in Maine, and we had deer and yes. turkey and the occasional bobcat or mountain lion, because we do mm-hmm. have them up here. Um, mm-hmm. Bears, porcupines, you name it. We had a little variety of everything, so it wasn't so bad. <laughs> I'm so jealous. We have deer. Mm-hmm. Uh, all around us, and we don't actually have them in the garden because our fencing's good enough so that they don't come and eat it all. That's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's sort of handy. Not that I totally object, but I do totally object, really. <laughs> <laughs> I planted uh, that. I'll feed you some if I want to. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But uh, I do envy you the, the, the cats. Mm-hmm. We, the largest, mm, the largest sort of semi. Well, the largest carnivore is probably a fox in this country. Oh, wow. <laughs> exactly. Yes, so you don't <laughs> have to worry too, too much. <laughs> <laughs> <That's the same. laughs> 
That's good. Yeah, and you have two cats of your own and a husband, so you have a full house. <laughs> yes, that's quite enough, thank you. Yes. yes. <laughs> no more pets. He doesn't actually get he doesn't actually go out and live in the middle of the world, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now, how many books have you written? Well, I'm just completing literally, seriously, my eleventh. Oh wow. Um, which is on Merlin. Mm-hmm. See, I love those stories. Um, all right, this isn't um, this isn't fiction. This is ah. about about him from what I know from our old ways and our and what I've been trained and um, my own experience. Uh, so it's not a, a rehash of the old stories, although I I know them mm-hmm. and I bring them up in the book. So. That's that's supposed to come out fairly soon because the, the publisher is harassing me to get it finished. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the name of this book? Um, this one is called Merlin, the Once and Future Wizard. Ah. Now, Merlin was a, a true human being, correct? Uh, he was several human ah. beings. Ah, okay. Um, I'm just trying to have a little count on my fingers. It gets onto two hands. <laughs> wow. Yeah, he wasn't just one, mm-hmm. and he's lived at many different times. Where I live now um, is one of the places where um, he he was a human being for a while. Hmm. And See, he... now this is a book I would really get into reading because I love, you know, the old it's, history. It's, it's not so much the old stories, it's the old history. Well, it's very hard to tell the difference between the old history and the old stories mm. because history, you know, comes from academics who've read lots of tomes that other people have written, who've read lots of tomes that other people have written. Mm-hmm. And it can end up a bit Chinese whispers from that. Yeah. <laughs> and so and it, it is what, true that a lot of the old <laughs> lore that we read has a lot of truth to it. It does, but it doesn't come over in everyday speak or scientific speak or um, history university speak or anything like that. It, mm-hmm. it comes over, especially our stories, and I think the Irish are just as bad. They come over almost like riddles, mm-hmm. worse than Zen. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you can't, you think, well, you think it's that so-and-so. And you say, well, no, actually, it isn't. It's so-and-so as well. And, <laughs> and so you have to work yourself around that. But, no, I actually live in uh, about a mile from where one of the Merlins was born. Oh, wow. So that must be, you know, very interesting to be in that area to be able to write about it too so it is it's been so interesting just to pick up all the local stories which of course I didn't know before I came here Mm -hmm. and um and I didn't know we were coming here and about a month after we arrived it's perfectly it's perfectly the right place Mm -hmm. but it hadn't been it wasn't where we'd intended to be and about a month afterwards I was in the local map shop um looking for local maps so that I could go walking and find out where we were and where the footpaths were. Mm -hmm. And I kid you not, this sounds like something out of a film, a book fell on my head. Uh, It it wanted (laughs) you to read it. (laughs) So I picked it up and it was a local, a book by a local author um, called Arthurian Connections in Herefordshire, Hmm. which is where I live. The county is called Herefordshire. And so, of course, I thought, well, right, okay, got to buy that. And that sort of just sort of opened it up. And I went, oh, that's why I'm living here. Yes. I have, I've had a connection with Merlin all my life. He just keeps cropping up. And I thought, all right. <laughs> now I know why I'm here. I'm supposed, I'm supposed to live in one of your places, am I? Thank you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it, it's nice when they do something nice for you. <laughs> it is absolutely gorgeous and um, such fun. So anyway, I'm trying to finish that. Um, well, Trevor said he wanted it. My publisher said he wanted it by the end of the month, but I think he's going to get it by about the 4th or 5th of July. <laughs> the current rate of progress. <laughs> yes, and I'm taking time from her writing to do an interview. <laughs> 
Now, you were in the midst of your third novel. Yes. And uh, this one is about? Well, um, <sighs> it's set in largely in um, southwest France, Cathar country, mm -hmm. which I know very well. Um, and bits of it are in London, which, of course, I know very well. And it's about a girl who finds she has connections with the old Templar treasure. Ooh. No, it's not Dan Brown. <laughs> 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 no, please. <laughs> um, and her father... Um, can, comes from down there and she has to go back there and pick up the pieces kind of thing when he's gone uh. and she finds things and then she starts finding she has to follow them and eventually she comes to the place of the Templar treasure no spoilers okay <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, no spoilers. I don't want spoilers. Plus, you have eight other books that yeah. are mostly on the aspects of the British native sh shamanism. Yeah. So you have quite a few books. I don't know how you can write two books at one time. I'm still trying to write one. <laughs> it's very hard. It's not easy, but you just, you sort of like mornings are for this and afternoons are for that mm -hmm. kind of thing. You can't try and do both of them together or you end up not doing anything at all. Yeah, or you'd end up writing the wrong story in the wrong book. That would be me. <laughs> Multitasking uh, is not my thing. I probably end up rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> you go back and read it and you think, good God. You Oops, think I think a writer? <laughs> <laughs> now, did you always see yourself as being a writer? Yes. I used to tell stories and scribble stories. And as soon as I could write anything, you'd, you'd have a small piece of paper with a story on it. You know, Mommy, I've got a story. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, but it didn't happen. I started writing. No, I first started writing in the early 80s, mm -hmm. but nothing. I didn't do anything with it, didn't chase it up. And then I got um, very ill and had to leave work, and we came to live up here. And that's really when I was able to start writing. I'd got time and space. Mm-hmm. And you do need that, as I'm sure you know. Oh, yes. That's why I'm having such a hard time writing my book. <laughs> no, I know. You have to do other things as well anyway. Yes, yes, you do. And, and you know, life goes on around you. And unless you have, like, this perfect little bubble you can be in, forget it. It's just, you know, there's so many things going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out someday. <laughs> a mountaintop with a cave with Wi-Fi. Yes, exactly. So. Okay. I, I don't mind. I I do a lot of my writing longhand because what happens is I'll be sitting doing nothing or something, yeah. you know, and just have a free moment and a thought will run through my head. I have more scraps of paper with just notes on it that, you know, I'd like to add this and I'd like to add that and, you know, research I've done and just mm -hmm. if I could ever get it all organized and put together and typed up, I'd be doing okay. <laughs> you will. You will one day. <laughs> yeah. I, I figured out one day I'm going to be able to do it. So you now will. you must do this pretty much so full time then. I do. Yeah. Uh, I've got my students um, mm -hmm. I'm teaching, so really what for me it is, is is mornings are writing, I'm up at about six o'clock and I write till about midday and I don't get up, mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got my laptop in bed <laughs> with the cats. There you go, <laughs> have to have the cats there. Don't come near me to anybody and um, then I get up and have something to eat and get dressed and all the rest of that stuff and um then the afternoons you know i'll sort of have a bit of a break and then it's like pick up where the, what students need whatever they need and deal with them hmm. so it does actually get divided yeah um but i love having them they're, they're such fun so i couldn't miss them out as well as you know instead of having the writing plus so they, they keep your mind active too because you know they're <laughs> going to come up with questions that you yourself may not have come up with. No, not may not, have not. <laughs> you say, good God, I'd never have thought of it like that. Yes, yes, exactly. So and It's lovely, and you, you just have to respond. But it's so good to respond, and it does, you say, it just 
opens your mind continuously. Mm-hmm. You don't get stuck in a in such a rut. Yes, and it, and it's great to have a good teacher too because the only reason I completed high school <laughs> was because I had a language arts teacher mm. that was just amazing. He was an incredible teacher, and if it would not have been for him, I, I probably would have given up on school long before graduating. And it was so funny because my daughter, my oldest daughter, mm-hmm. ended up having him as a teacher. Oh, no. How lovely. Yeah. So we went to, when she told me she had Mr. Lively, that was his name, I was like, oh, my God, I couldn't wait to go <laughs> to the parent-teacher night. <laughs> And I walked in the room and and I met him and he had broken his foot. So he was in a wheelchair. Yeah. And and he looked so much older and I'm looking at him going, wow, that was my teacher. And uh, I walked into the room and I introduced myself. I said, you don't remember me, do you? He goes, you look familiar. I said, well, my maiden name was Cortell. And he was like, oh, I remember you. (laughs) I was like, please don't take it out on my daughter. (laughs) She's a really good student. Yeah, I I got into a lot of trouble in his class, but he was just one of those teachers that was just, he knew how to get to a student, you know, a troubled student that was going to, I was a troublemaker, um, and he knew how to get to me, and he did, and I ended up, language was like, you know, language arts was it. I just, I I wanted more and more and more and more, and I majored in it, and it was just, that was it. I, I loved it, and it was thanks to him. And, and it's great to have teachers like that. It is, and I do agree with you, because I had the same sort of thing, and in mine was she taught English and history. Mm-hmm. And there was another uh, teacher who taught art who was very, very good as well. And without them, I, I'd have run away. Yeah, yeah. The the you end up with some teachers that just don't care. You know, well, and, I, and, and the ones that do are mm-hmm. just amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And of course, her being an English teacher as well. I mean, she encouraged all the reading and the the books and the writing as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was very, very, you know, hot and good on English language mm-hmm. and the grammar studies. Um, so, you know, I, I I sometimes wonder if I'm a grammar Nazi myself, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, you know, all this texting and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> The shortening of words drives me crazy. Well, but I can still grumble like an old woman, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's all the shortening of words that drive me nuts when people text. My daughter will text me, and it takes me fifteen minutes to decipher. It. I'm like, what is that? So what is that? Yeah. it up the other way, yes, it works. Yes. And, yes. <laughs> so yes, I agree. A, a good teacher, and hopefully, well, they all seem to like me. So at least that's something. That's that's always a plus. <laughs> So now, talking about your book, Moon Song, can you give us a little insight on the main character and basically the story? Well, it grew, it grew out of I, another of the old stories, which I'm sure you know, Tristan and Isolde, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the old love story, mm-hmm. and which I know very well, and I know the Cornish places, the places in Cornwall, where <laughs> it's supposed to have happened. That's another one which <clears throat> actually happens in various places in Ireland, Cornwall, Brittany um, as well. So it, it's one of those, one of our stories that moves. Yes. Anyway, it's a love story um, and a tragic love story, which where things don't work out. Mm. And it started to grow out of that. Only I've turned it upside down a little bit. The heroine is Isolde. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's set in the modern day, you know, say, first decade of the 20, 21st century, say. Mm-hmm. And she's a journalist. And she's come from Belfast, because in most of the stories, Isolde was an Irish princess mm-hmm. uh, who came from a bit north of Belfast. She comes from Belfast of the Troubles, of all the all the Irish Troubles, and she used to live just off Falls Road, which is one of the worst places. Ah. Uh, Had a lot of problems between um, her mother and her father, one of whom was Catholic and one of whom was Protestant. So this is the behindhand. So Mm -hmm. so she's she's ended up a bit like... um, Shakespeare says in Romeo and Juliet, a plague on both your houses and leaves. Mm -hmm. Comes to London, gets a really good job on a big paper as a journalist and is doing very well, except for the fact that it's still going on. 
um, it's not too long after 9-11. Mm -hmm. So we were all policemen with guns and flak jackets, which we're not used to Yeah. Um, over here. And it all gets too much. So she goes off to get a job with an old boyfriend down in the West Country. And there she, she loves music and mm -hmm. she loves folk music. And she's heard that this lovely Cornish folk singer that she's followed all her life is suddenly dead. And so she's very upset. And of course, he's called Tristan. Ah. And so she goes down anyway. And, you know, OK, he's dead. He was ill. It's fine. Um, and I miss him. And she gets involved with the music crowd down there as well as the book crowd and all sorts of stuff. And she meets this wonderful young man who is um, an organist, a professional church organist. You know, not mm -hmm. in a church, he's a concert organist. And he was Tristan's foster brother. But oh. she doesn't do that at first. And they fall in love and then she finds out. Um, and he's called Mark, so I have used all the names. <laughs> and um, then she comes, they fall in love, she goes down to live with him. And finds that all the local spirits of place are saying Tristan shouldn't have died then. He hadn't finished. Hmm. He was writing his songs and he hasn't finished the last song, the moon song. That he's dead. That you've got to go and get it. Wow. So she has to go to the Isles of the Dead and um, find Tristan and bring him back and get the song. Now, this has a lot to do with the Fae folk as well, correct? Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah. See, now, I, I love Fae. Mm -hmm. I, I study Fae magic. So, yeah, it just, this is a book I have to read. <laughs> this is a book I have to read. Well, this think, is on my want list. So, I yes. I think you'll like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Now, funny and question. About, that, that is about our old tradition. Yeah. So you will feel it, feel it in that as well. So I'm bringing all that out. But of course, it's a love story and it's romance and people have problems and relationships and all the usual stuff. Right. And and that's real life, too. <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it's real life is stranger perfect. than fiction, but, you know, hey. <laughs> now, this sounds like a funny question, but why do you write? Because mm, I can't not. <laughs> um. Sometimes, you know, I like I go away um, and like you, then I have to take some longhand unless I can, it's a place where I can take my computer. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't be still. I like going out um, and wild camping in the woods here. Mm -hmm. And I go out with some friends sometimes. And, you know, they're quite happy sort of sat around the fire and, you know, maybe having a coffee or a beer or something like that. But... I have to go back and I've just got to sit there and start, even if I'm in scribbling in a book, it's mm -hmm. lying in my hammock. I can't just chill. Mm -hmm. It's not chilling for me. So it's an itch. I have to do it. If I don't write, I shall go nuts. Yeah, it's like if you don't get it out of your head, it will just stay there and drive you crazy. Yeah, it does. Yeah. 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 yeah I can relate just, with that. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but it actually makes my skin itch. I, I've never noticed that. But yeah. I do know if I don't get something out of my head, if it's 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 just saying you have to write this down, you have to write this down. If I don't yeah. do it, yeah. it, it just won't leave me alone. No, no, no. I quite agree with you. Absolutely. <laughs> now, do you get writer's block? Yes. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> and you just sit there thinking, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> I don't like this character. Um this one's boring. Um, I don't know what I'm doing. I think I'll start another book. <laughs> right. And um, you just have to do, I find I have to do something else. Mm -hmm. and that's one advantage of writing two books at once because the nonfiction is not so hard to write. Yeah. And so, you know, I can go off and write some of the nonfiction stuff and then come back. Uh, but I do other things. I mean, you know, like we've got a lovely garden here, so I go out and mess about in that, or else I'll go for a walk or, um, you know, go and see somebody or just go and sit on the hilltop and, and get away and stop thinking about it. 
walk I think away for a little happens. bit and sometimes it'll come back to you. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes I think you get so wound up in your sort of frontal consciousness, your forebrain, mm-hmm. that, you know, your back brains, they're sort of saying, I wish you'd listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, how much research do you do when you're writing? Oh, tons. Tons and tons and tons. Um, I thank God, all the gods, for having (laughs) computer and the internet. Because, Mm -hmm. um, like with the one that I'm writing now, uh, with The Spring Bones, which is set in France, Mm -hmm. I would love to be off to France every five minutes. Right. Um, You know, now, does that road go up there? And was that castle that side or that side? Mm Mm-hmm. Um... At that level, and then there's, I just want to go and sit in that forest by that stream or that lake and get the feel for this, and I need to be on that mountain. And, of course, I can't. Um, I'm really not making enough as a writer to be off to France every five minutes. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, writers don't make all that much money. People. No, we don't. <laughs> and it's definitely not something to do in, in unless you happen to be lucky to make loads of money. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can't do that. So the computer enables me to actually find things, find pictures. And even with Google Map, I had a problem with a bit of the road, where there's there's, um, a road trip bit in Whispering Bones. Mm -hmm. And I've done it, but it was about 20 years ago when I did it. So I thought, I wonder what it's like now. And you know Google Maps allows you to do it. Mm-hmm. You can actually drive that road. Yes. And that was amazing. And I thought, oh, I'm getting the idea. And then I could sort of lie back and, yeah, let it come through. Then mm-hmm. the road trip was working. And, and I knew that I was going to be doing it right. Because that was the other trouble, because things change. Yes. And so you write it for somebody and they said, but it doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, no, there are four left turns there, not three. And and it, it stops the reader once you get one of those. I know it does me. Mm-hmm. So I really need to do that. But then there's all the stuff that you've just got to research into, like I was with Isolde. Where does she come from? Mm-hmm. Who is she? What was it like there? Um, what were Who were her parents? You have to build up masses of backstory. Mm-hmm. Otherwise you don't know the characters. Why, why would they act like that? Oh, it's because. And you can get into the, their past and, and work it out. So, yes, there's tons and tons of research to do, particularly for fiction. Oh, yes. Now, what was the hardest part about writing your books? Um, I suppose, really, once they're, re- once they're written, you have to edit. Mm-hmm. Because your first writing is wonderful and absolutely gorgeous and fabulous and actually doesn't quite work. Mm-hmm. And you haven't got the sentence quite right. It doesn't flow. Um, um, or you missed a bit. Or actually that bit would be better after this bit. Um, that's slogging because it isn't creative. Mm-hmm. And you have to go over the manuscript. I always make myself do it at least three times before it goes out to a proofreader and mm-hmm. an editor. Um, so that I'm fairly sure that I have said pretty well what I meant to say and that it does largely work. But it's hard. That's where I am with the Merlin book at the moment, and it's hard work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially hard. editing your own work. Oh, and you can never see everything that's wrong. No. Because you know what should be there. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I know it's supposed to be there. I wrote it. <laughs> you know? that, that, yeah. That's- that exactly. Is, that is C A T. It is not K A T. Yeah. It yeah. isn't. It's K A T. You know, but mm-hmm. yeah, you can't see that. Yeah. And, and you know. and you say that you always read your work out loud to yourself. So if your voice stumbles, now I do that. It's and I thought I was the only one who did that because if my voice stumbles, then I know something's not right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so, it so works, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Because you 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 go along and you say whatever it is you're going to say, and, and your voice goes, oh, 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 oh. And yeah, you think, no, no, it's like, okay, was... something's wrong there. Yeah, yeah, I've got to, re- got to rephrase that. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I thought I was the only one who did that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was just crazy, so I, I've I feel got better another, now. <laughs> I've got one other friend who does it, so at least three of us. Oh, good, good. I feel better now. I, I have a group of people. Good. <laughs> <laughs> now, what was the easiest part in writing your books? Um, The ideas come like mad. 
Mm-hmm. which um, drives me insane. It probably drives you insane too because you think, I'm, I'm still writing this one mm-hmm. and I've got three more ideas on the show. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. So there is a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a forward list mm-hmm. I have to write, um, which is very nice. So the ideas come. And the other bit that is really good is once, once I'm there and really with the character... The characters write themselves. They write what they're going to do, and they write the story, and they write the plot. I'm very character-driven. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm there typing away, and I think, goodness me, I didn't know we were going to do that. Yeah. Because <laughs> really sometimes into... they do take over. Yeah, it's like somebody else has got my fingers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly, and they, and they do. They take over. Um, I was talking with Robert Her- Robin Hearn, yeah. And he was another one who said that, yes, that, you know, and, and uh, oh, who else? M.R. Sellers mm-hmm. said that he had written characters in and thought they were just going to make a one time show. And then he ended oh. up doing a whole slew of books about that one character that just did a one time show in one book. So, I thought one of those. yeah, they just kind of <laughs> take over and say, no, you're not done with me yet. <laughs> the one in my first novel has given me a whole idea for another novel for in his youth mm-hmm. and, and I'm there sort of going oh really <laughs> <laughs> I mean it sounds absolutely fascinating um, yes but you know it's sort of like um yeah hang on to it I'll try not to die before I've written it <laughs> mm-hmm. exactly it's like don't 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 let it go I, I'll okay. get to you I promise I will get, I will you. get to you <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah. now how do you publish your books, and why do you choose this way to do it? Well, I began with my first novel, Owl Woman, um, on doing it myself. Mm-hmm. Um, because I wanted it out there, and I was struggling away um, trying to get an agent and doing it in the... What I feel now is the old-fashioned publishing way. Mm-hmm. And anyway, it got out, and... Um, not terribly long after, the um, editor who I now work for at John Hunt, um, he found me, and he actually found me on Facebook. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. You think Facebook's no good. It is. Yes, <laughs> yes. Just be careful, but yeah. And he sort of said, hmm, you know, and we friended, and then he started muttering, and he said, are you writing anything at the moment? And so I, I chucked... Um, the Celtic chakras at him, and mm-hmm. he said yes. And there we are. That's awesome. Uh, and they're really nice, and they're modern, and they believe in eBooks, and they believe in Facebook and Facebook groups and podcasting, and all the modern stuff that, that people do. Um, well, so it's really, really good because that's useful. You you meet you're reaching your audience. You know, in ways that they want to do. You know, they, they want their Kindle. They want to be able to hear your podcast on the phone. They want to be able to hear you read a bit of your book on the phone. Um, and they they believe in this. And it works. So I'm really pleased with them. And that's why I stay with them. Yes. And, and that makes a big difference, too. You have to be pleased with who's publishing. And yeah. there are so many different ways yes. that you can publish now. I mean, you can publish your own books. Exactly. And it's no longer... St- you know, the stigma that it used to be, oh, your vanity publishing. And um, no, you know, it's, it's now called indie publishing, which is really nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so things get out there. And yeah. John Hunt doesn't sort of object to that either. Well, that's good. You know, it's not sort of your mind, shut up, don't touch anything else, you're not mm-hmm. allowed to publish on your own. And it's, it's none of this sort of, parental autocratic stuff it's how can we do this have you got any ideas for that mm-hmm. uh, which is really really worthwhile so I, I stick with them I'm so what do you do now to relax um you probably need to edit this i watch gratuitous violence on the television sometimes <laughs> <laughs> arnie schwarzenegger and a glass of wine <laughs> there you go there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> 
Uh, any any sort of nice hunky looking male and glass of wine is good relax. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, no, I also, You're married, not dead. <laughs> I am definitely not dead. Yes. <laughs> And I garden, and I walk, and I paint, and uh, I do watercolours, um, sort of weird chinese sort of watercolours, and I spin and knit. Uh, now, what is spinning? Is that where you make the yarn? Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't anymore because I'm feeling sort of too old and weak. I, I can go from, I can't actually shear the sheep. Mm -hmm. I can go from the, the sheared fleece mm -hmm. um, to the completed garment. Oh, wow. Um, but now I stick to the spinning bit. You've got to do loads of stuff to the fleece before you can spin it, but I stick to the spinning bit and then I either knit or weave, mm -hmm. um, which I thoroughly enjoy doing. And it's very so restful. Yes, I, I, I crochet. Uh, I'm not oh, great. Yeah. I'm not great at it. Um, I, I know how to do a square and I know how to go back and forth. So, you know, <laughs> and I'm learning. I'm learning different little stitches. YouTube is wonderful for that. Isn't um, it? Yeah. But yeah, it's very relaxing. Yeah. The yeah. only problem is, is I have problems with my hands, so I can't do it as long as I'd like to. But yeah, I it is very relaxing. I have problems with my hands too. And they're all twisted and that, so you can't do it for as long as you wish, but no. you, can, you do it for a bit. Yep. And, and that's now, which it. authors have inspired you? Oh, um, Ursula Le Guin, mm -hmm. uh, Roger Zelazny, Meaningful, mm -hmm. science, science Fantasy Fiction, mm -hmm. and a um, woman called Terry Windling. Um, she's only written one real novel but she used to edit with um ellen datlow the tour books mm -hmm. and used to put together uh collections of fairy stories um from all over the world but a lot of it european Ooh. and they're fabulous so they three um winnie the pooh <laughs> who i would not I, you know, I still have my original copy of and a door, Wind in the Willows. Mm -hmm. Who else do I like? Alice in Wonderland. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Actually, I live down. The, I live up the road from where he wrote it. Oh wow! Which again, I didn't know. <laughs> it's amazing when you find out things about your own area, your own neighborhood. You know it what is. I mean? It is. In my friend, I've got a friend who um, she now lives in the vicarage, which. Um, his brother had at the time where he used to go and stay to write Alice. Mm -hmm. And so he's going, oh, that's where that was, was it? <laughs> <laughs> and that, and that's got to be neat, you know. That's just got to be so neat to be it, able to it, do it, that. Nothing about it. You just walk into it and you go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know where I am now. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I adore it. <laughs> Now, for your own reading, which do you prefer, an actual book or, like, digital? Uh, nowadays, I digital. Mm -hmm. uh, and my Kindle, I have to do. I actually find it, because I've got the arthritis, mm -hmm. um, it's actually hard work to hold a book. Yeah. And to hold it open. It, it actually puts strain on my wrists, and that will go through up into my arms. So, um, a Kindle. But I... I've still got all my books. Mm -hmm. uh, I go around and sniff them every night. Yes. You know the smell of a book? Oh, yes, 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 yes. That is my favorite thing. There is a, in Salem, Massachusetts, oh. which I used to spend a lot of time there, they have a bookstore called Wicked Good Books. Oh. And it is a used bookstore. Oh. So you go in there and you smell the old books. That oh, is the first that. scent you get when you walk in there. Oh, I love that store. Yeah. I don't even have to buy anything. Just walk around. <laughs> No, I, if I come over, we're going there. Okay, that sounds great. <laughs> I will take you right there. I will show you all of Salem. I used to spend every other weekend in Salem, it, Mass, because I so lived in Lowell. Good. Yeah, it's beautiful. Now, it, there's a lot of commercial, but I do okay. know the places that are not, um, yeah. that are actual true witch stores and stuff like mm -hmm. that, and not just the yeah. commercial stuff to sell. But, yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I'm on the plane on, on Thursday, okay? Okay, sounds good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, have you collaborated with other authors to do books? I haven't yet, although I've just started with a friend, um, mm -hmm. 
longtime friend, we go, she lives in Scotland, and so I go up once a year and we hike around in the Highlands mm-hmm. of Scotland, which is totally magical. I can imagine. <laughs> We're both mildly nuts, and um, she's deeply into all the wildlife stuff, but she's also, um, she goes out onto the hills and uh, shoots her own dinner, her deer. Oh. Nice. So, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> mm, yum. <laughs> um, um, and she's good. Um, mm-hmm. We're both sort of have this sort of craziness about us. So when we were up there in April, we started talking about stuff, in a, um, dystopian stuff, you know, like when, when the shit hits the fan kind of thing mm-hmm. and what would happen. And we've started a joint novel about an SAS soldier who's um, retired and mm-hmm. gone up to live in the Highlands just after uh, whatever has happened that the shit has hit the fan and mm-hmm. the world falling apart. And it's fascinating. And the two of us writing together, I mean, that's what we did every night. You know, we go out and walk the places every day. Mm-hmm. And then we come home at night and we'd be sat on the sofa with sort of tons of tea and the occasional beer. And mm-hmm. we'd be writing the story. Um, but, of course, I can't finish it at the moment because I've got Whispering Bones to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got Merlin to finish. Yes. <laughs> Who's bad? <laughs> Try three with a friend. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you, you can never have too many books going on at once. Oh, you can, you can. You just mm. end up going crazy. But he, he does sound fun and we're both keen. But she's got stuff to do and I've got stuff to do, so... We're sort of looking at July, August, we'll get back together and, and, and start trying to pull it together again. But it's fun. But I think oh, yeah. if you're going to do it, you've got to, you've got to be able to argue with the other person. Yes. Because you're not going to agree. No. Every now and again, you're going to say, that's absolute rubbish, you can't possibly say that. And you've just got to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Without um, offending each other at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, nobody's got to go off and in a huff afterwards. Mm-hmm. Uh, or if you do go off in a huff, you know, come back soon. Yes. Um, but you, you've got to be able to sort of do all that and then sort of lean back on the sofa and say, right, now where were we? <laughs> yes, exactly. Now, do you have any advice for aspiring writers like myself? <laughs> right, darling. Put some of the stuff down and write. Um it really is good to have a discipline, like try and write yourself, I don't know, even 500 words a day. Mm-hmm. A thousand is what they usually say, but if you can manage to write a 500 words a day, even if they might, tomorrow you might think they're rubbish, write them. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't actually write, it doesn't work. You're not practicing. And the other side of it is read, 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 mm-hmm. because that expands you. Yeah, that's that's my biggest thing is is knowledge is power, and you can never learn too much. No, and other people's styles, other people's little phrases of weighing, ways of saying something, it'll just spark you off. Mm-hmm. And so write and read, and when you can't stand it anymore, go for a walk. Yes. And and I totally believe in walking. If you're in a bad mood, take a walk. Yeah. The By the time, time you get back, your your mood will totally yeah, change. It'll be it'll be different. You'll be fine. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. agree with that one absolutely. Now, where can our listeners find your books to check them out and purchase them? Well, probably in some bookstores, but Amazon. <laughs> Amazon, 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 Amazon dot com, Amazon dot uk, Amazon dot whatever. And yours are available on Kindle as well. Yes. 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 Well, that's through Amazon because they own it now. Mm -hmm. Um, But, um, yeah, and they're also available through Barnes & Noble over there and on Nook, I think. So, um, but if you just head into Amazon, you'll find the books and then you'll find places to go. And if you head into Barnes & Noble's site, you'll find it and find places to go. Mm -hmm. And you have your own website as well, correct? I do. And what is that for our listeners? Um, www.ellensantier.co.uk Perfect. That, so no that way... 
No dots in my name. <laughs> no dots in the name. <laughs> and and that's good because then they can they can go right to your website too and find out yeah. what you're going to be writing soon and what's going to be coming up next. And if they can't remember anything else, just just Google Ellen Santier and and something will come up. Mm -hmm. So you'll be all right. There you go. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for for coming on here, Ellen, and and letting us get a glimpse into your world. It's been amazing. It's been delightful talking to you. All right, everybody, stay tuned. There is more to come. <laughs>